are listening to Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong, all on Georgia Radio Network. Welcome to episode 39 of the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. I'm Dave Roberts. Yes, that Dave Roberts. With me as always is Matt Lowe. What's up? And the blogging hack, <laughs> Jessica Salaji. Thanks for allowing me to participate in this high-ranking podcast, even though I'm just a hack. <laughs> I'm grateful. You know, that's one of my favorite things that you do is essentially the, the mean tweets is copy the stupid stuff that you get sent or the things that people say on, on, your, uh, on your Facebook posts. I learned a long time ago that if you laugh at the people who are making fun of you, then you don't take it personally. Like sometimes I do, Matt knows, sometimes I just get upset. But for the most part, um, it's easier to make fun of them. And then when everyone else agrees with you about how stupid they are, then you just feel better about yourself. So. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it also makes for good comedy. I mean, I thought that was one of the smarter things done was having celebrities read the mean tweets written about them. And it, it is a way of belittling the people who write that stuff because they're hiding behind their keyboard and you're out front in public and, you know, you're your opinions are exposed and this guy gets to hide behind his keyboard and, and and call you names and belittle what you do while he does nothing. Well, and there are people who offer like legitimate criticism that I'm like, huh, I didn't think about that. Or, you know what? I need to be better about that next time. Like that, that happens. But when they're just talking about like my hair color, which I pay a lot of money for, by the way, or, you know, like just personal attacks then it's it's not constructive it doesn't bring anything to the conversation and they deserve to be made fun of you pay a lot of money for that hair color yes ah okay everyone thinks it's natural i know me and shady have the same hair color but actually (laughs) we go to the same person (laughs) and i hate that y'all talk about this often enough (laughs) that we have to edit out comments i've made (laughs) <laughs> no it it it, it really it, it is it, it's funny just from you know i try not to or i try to comment on your stuff rarely because we get once a week that i can beat you up on a thing you say but you actually put something out last week when i was out of the country um or two weeks ago uh, saying that people's remarks on your writing helps you become a better writer and that's you know indicative of somebody who takes their profession seriously that if someone says hey you could have done this better or, or, or phrase it this way huh that's really good that's that that's a that's helpful to to my growth as a, as a professional not you're a poopy head <laughs> right <Hey. laughs> your roots are long <laughs> <laughs> and matt you are a deer slayer again this year no nah, man i got lucky <laughs> that doesn't mean the deer's not dead. No. Oh yeah, deer's are deader than hell. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so Paul and Forest Public Land, by the way, um, which interestingly enough is only open deer and rifle season for like eight days, right? They're open for four days in November, and this is pretty much given away exactly when we're recording, but. Um, they're open for four days in November and four days in December, uh, usually right around the middle of the month. And uh, I took a couple of my kids out this week. Ava wanted to go. She's three. And, um, you know, at that age, it's more about just making sure she has fun. You know, so you go late in the evening so that you're not there very long because they lose interest real quick. Like when they're kids, you know, but it was funny. She's making all kinds of funny faces. And I'll tell you the, the funniest part of it. And I had, I didn't make a single post about it or anything, but 
we get up on top of this mountain and we get settled and she goes dad I gotta pee <laughs> I was like alright let me teach you how to pee in the woods girl <laughs> so <laughs> she's she's peeing <laughs> and she she lets out this little fart <laughs> and <laughs> makes this O face at me and says that wasn't me dad that was a bear <laughs> nice crack me up but anyway so no I, I killed a really nice um, very old very mature buck that um, scouting Thursday and Friday with my boys and then middle of the day Saturday you know we we figured out he was there I uh, just didn't know when he was coming through and Sunday afternoon about 3.30 he came crashing through and uh, he paused long enough before he jumped a creek at 92 yards that I let him have it well I mean you are the example of what hunters all should be and that is you're putting groceries on the table right <laughs> Well, no, it, I got to feed it, all these kids somehow. Yeah, and I say and I say that with admiration. It's not, even though that was a mature buck that you know will look good on, would look good on anybody's wall. That's not what it was about. It's about sharing the outdoors with your kids and putting food on the table and showing the next generation where food comes from. Right. No, now, I I do like that. Uh, 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 I, I, the uh, I, I I almost sometimes I describe it as having a, a bit more intimate relationship with my food than the average person of that and your family. Right. I mean, I, I've taken kids fishing and you're right. The attention span isn't there. The fact that you had a three year old with you who, uh, okay. All you guys who dress in the field, Matt had a three year old pee next to his stand. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I you know what? I don't I don't buy into that that they I pee next to my stand. I you know if I'm out, I'll just stand up and pee because urine is urine. It's all I mean. It's ammonia and some other leftover stuff, right? So, well, it's death fluid. <clears throat> Diesel emission <laughs> right. fluid is what it is. I just I think that they don't I don't think they smell it and they're like oh that's human pee that's fox pee you know I think they just it registers to them as urine and I'm sure there is some differences but the only way they would know is if they watched me pee and realized that that's what I was doing and then came over and smelled it and then that one single deer would know oh that's what human urine smells like and that's not information that they can pass along to their dear buddies so you mean it's not disney they don't actually talk to thumper no no <laughs> no you, you know i'm a big believer in murphy's law if you want to see a deer stand up in your stand and take down your zipper that's how i shot one saturday morning me and logan I'm, were sitting there and logan was like he was like, I'm going to go to sleep. I'm like, I'm going to stand up and pee. And I stood up to pee, and I took one last look in the direction, and there was one standing there 40 yards away. And I was like, well, I'm busted as crap now. So, like, I didn't even I'd try to, like, sneak back to my seat or anything. I Because I'd stepped out of or stepped over my rifle, right? So now I have to step back over my rifle to get back in my seat. Uh, we were hunting from the ground. I had these little, their little hunting chairs that have little stumpy legs, and uh, like I wasn't even sneaky about it. I just was like, "Well, I'm busted as crap," so I just sat back down. But the way that we were hidden in there with the a backdrop and our, you know, just trusted my camo, it worked. Well, I mean, it works for everything. I mean, if you want, if I want my phone to ring. <laughs> right, go to the bathroom. Yep. 
I won't say it, it happens enough that it's like you know if I want my phone to ring, just, yeah, just just be indisposed for a moment. And I know this is such good political commentary. I mean, <laughs> right. uh, you just you just said last episode that you were not going to do a, an out outdoor podcast. Yet here we are. Right. <laughs> well, I'd had the idea about doing a podcast um, with my kids and recording from the deer stand and just talking to them about it. Uh, well, your audio sucks when you're inside, so... Right. <laughs> so how was your vacation? Man, you guys know this. The night before I was to fly out, uh, I was feeling good. Uh, coming to, you know, went, went up to my office to do something. Came, I was coming down the stairs in socks and... Uh, fell and either hyperextended or dislocated my knee. So I spent my uh, vacation on crutches. And I was, yeah, I I was unaware of how much energy you actually expend trying to move around on crutches until I tried to get around around the Atlanta airport. (laughs) You, You didn't get them to ride you around in one of those little carts? Man, I'm a little too fat for it. Because... If, when you look at me, I'm just a little too fat. You have to wonder: is his dis- disability his fatness? <laughs> no. At, at one point, uh, my wife did flag down the, the golf cart because we just had to get down to the gate. But coming home, uh, oddly enough, I had a, a a a federal agent standing there with an M16 who's looking at me, and he's got a, a little bit of a, a, a Latin accent. He goes, "Man, you should have gotten a wheelchair." I can see it in your face, man. That's that's nothing but pride. You get a wheelchair. <laughs> nothing but pride. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I ruined our vacation. Couldn't walk on the beach. You know, had had to do a day of activity, then 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 a day off. That 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 sort of thing, and ice the leg. Watched the. Uh, the results come in, you know, laying on my back. Listen to uh, the podcast that came out, and you guys really did a did a, did a really good job. I, mean, I, I enjoyed know. it. We know we did such a good job. <laughs> and stayed Brent, on message. Brent, you hear this? <laughs> we did a great job. <laughs> Dave even said so. <laughs> oh. I, I, <laughs> Damn, I, she's calling out Brent. I'm the standard now. <laughs> it's like when Dad's away. <laughs> How the hell am I, Dad? <laughs> I wish you could see his face. Because you're it's old. Face. It's the same face he made when I asked if he was on Medicaid. <laughs> it was Medicare. <laughs> I was on Medicaid. <laughs> now I'm broke and old. <laughs> Good Lord. The abuse I take. Oh, Lord. And oh. what I did not enjoy being out of town. And coming back to the same thing is this drawn out Stacy Abrams. <sighs> Jessica, describe it. I don't even know how to how to describe what's going on. Um it's bullshit. <laughs> I mean <laughs> it's disgusting. I'm irritated. I really honestly was like sympathetic to her message on Wednesday and Thursday after the election, wanting to hear every, you know, all these stories and hear from the counties and make sure votes were counted. But like enough is enough. Enough is enough. People are exhausted over this. They're tired of it. And just saying things like from Hillary chiming in, saying that she would have won if she would have had a fair election. And it's ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. And everyone's over it. Now, Matt, this is not... Florida from 2000 
being separated by 400 votes. Right. No, it's, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the count is now. I know it's whatever it is, it's, it's the math doesn't work for her anymore. No. And it's, she's even, what I don't understand is she's even making her own case worse. Like she's sending out these emails every, you know, three or five hours with stories of voters who were wronged. And the most recent one show says like this girl named Monica or something tried to go and vote and they didn't accept her Massachusetts license. So she had to cast a provisional ballot. Like those are things that are in the law. You aren't wrong. That's not voter suppression. If you don't have a state driver's license, you can't cast a vote the same way everyone else who has a state driver's license. So I just, she's, she's, they're digging themselves in a hole and acknowledging that this isn't really about like actually influencing anything more than it is just delaying it, which I think is classless. Do you think that this is a, a, an attempt to, to fill her coffers for 2020 in a possible Senate, Senate race? You know, someone was talking about that the other day, and if if it is, it's it's very stupid. And here's why: because Purdue is the low hanging fruit that would be, you know, the the incumbent that she would be challenging, and the Purdue family is closely aligned with Trump and Kemp, and they're the reason that Trump got Kemp's endorsement. And pushing that, you, you basically be appealing to the same voters who supported Kemp when you when you go after Purdue. And so I don't, unless something changes dramatically in Georgia over the next two years, I don't foresee how the election results would be any different when you're essentially voting for the same people. Or, Matt, do you think she's trying to give Hollywood value for their dollar? Man, I don't know. I, I think... I, I It's... Oh, man, it's just something that I've come to expect from the Democratic Party since 2000 I, I just and and when when they lose a race and concede like they should you know I'm genuinely surprised by it yeah and, and we're not when you look at percentages you know you look at it and say that's really really close until you realize that there is a wide chasm and actual numbers of votes. Right, yeah. I mean, when you're talking about, what, what, what four million people is what voted? Mm, yeah. It, about, you know, say again. I said you're right. You know, 0.3% is a big-ass number. It's not, you know, it's it's you're not talking about, oh, we're separated by three or 4,000. You know, you're still 30 and 40 and 50,000. Well, I think Florida's going to recount until, you know, Nelson wins. You know, it's <clears throat> this is the land of ballots coming out of trunks. And, you know, we talked about this before when we talked about having a paper record. Is when you go back and look at that 2000 race, you've got individual poll workers who are driving unsecured boxes into counts and, and things like that. And pulling ballots out of out of the trunk, literally out of the trunks of their cars, right? And uh, the same suspects in Florida. It's 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 amazing, and I wish we could stop making the news for the wrong reasons. Did I see somewhere though that that uh, that lady that runs the Broward County elections is is being forced out? I you know, saw some headline, but I don't recall what it was about. I think I think I saw where they're finally going to have because she's like they have issues every election. <laughs> yeah. I saw I, now I've seen um, some people to bring it back to Georgia asking why why they couldn't have a private company do the elections. Oh, I think that's a recipe for corruption. Well, and specifically the lottery. Only because 
you know, the lottery man, they're on it. They tell you, you know, a hundred million people buy a ticket and they'll tell you by 6 a.m. how many tickets were sold with the winning number and where it was sold. Yeah, they, they may even track down the video, find a picture of the guy. Right. And look, I'm a, I'm a private guy. You know, I, I'd love to see a lot of things shift from government to to, to uh, private company. But man, prisons and elections mm-hmm. really need to, the onerous is on the government to to make that happen. I mean, it's it is a tough thing for me to say to hand over our sacred right to a, a company. And I'm a business owner. And I, and I, I don't say this lightly, but is one that could benefit by one party winning over another or one candidate over another and then handing that to them and expecting that they are going to they're going to hold up the pinnacle of integrity. I agree. I just you know, we are already at, humans are failures. I mean, they fall to corruption and bribes and all that all the time, but having something privatized where someone stands to gain financially and and with a contract and an awarding of a contract like all of that just stinks to high heaven look i I really think the uh the answer to this is getting rid of provisional ballots go where you're supposed to go vote when you're supposed to vote register when you're supposed to register Stay it's in your not, box. Yes, yeah, just stay in your box. It, it's not that difficult. Uh, I, I, I've never had a problem walking in and voting when I did everything the right way. I've had a problem once, and that was when I moved and I didn't didn't do the right thing. My, I, you know, I didn't change my my address, didn't register, and all all that stuff. You know, I had a, you know, we ran a friend for, for office and at his, you know, at one of his parties, like, oh, well, we couldn't vote. Why? Well, we've been inactive for five years or whatever the, whatever the length of time was. Well, that's part of purging the rolls. Right. So I, I, you know, and, and Matt, you, you, we joke about it as far as voter suppression being all about voter suppression, but it should take some effort on on the citizens' part to vote, man. I, like I had a, I was having a conversation with Jessica about this, and I don't remember if we talked about it on a podcast. But like I was like, you know, provisional ballots need to just go away. Like you've got two years from right now, right now, to get your shit together to go vote. You know, you got three weeks of early voting in a lot of places. And then an actual election day. If you can't get it together by then, you're too dumb to vote and you need to stay away from the polls anyway. I wouldn't go jump to too dumb to vote, but... I would. (laughs) I have to jump through hoops to exercise my Second Amendment. If I want to carry a pistol on me, I've got to go ahead of time and go file for a permit. And, and prove that I'm not a criminal and do all the other stuff that is a hindrance to my Second Amendment. But that scene is just fine. But the idea that you have to have an up-to-date ID is offensive to, to folks and think that they should just be able to walk up and same day uh, do same-day registration, uh, not need ID, or, or whatever else, show up to the wrong place because the lines are shorter over at this place, or, you know, this church versus that school. And expect their votes to be counted. And, you know, we and we see video of the people of Iraq having their fingers dyed purple, risking their lives, their very lives, to go and cast a ballot. And people in our country think it should be as easy as voting for American Idol. Right. <laughs> And for that, I'm an a-hole. Oh, that's what? not the only reason, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there are many reasons. Well, speaking of elections, 
London Lamar, an incoming Tennessee State House rep, calls Tennessee residents racist voters for for voting for the GOP and called them uneducated. I just love this because it's like the girl in the cafeteria like having breakfast before she goes upstairs to her new job and is like bad mouthing and trash talking people and then she finds out they're her colleagues. Like it's the same kind of thing. She's ticked off half of the state and she's always she hasn't even started. And I think it's fantastic. <laughs> it's gonna make everything so much worse for her and God willing, she doesn't get anything done. Well, Matt, let me read a uh her quote here, one of, one of the best. This is her quote. Let's just call a spade a spade. Tennessee is racist, period. Doesn't that phrase have its roots in racism? Well, how about the fact that a state, like, grammatically, a state cannot be racist? <laughs> that was my biggest problem with that, is that a state does not have feelings. She could have said the people of Tennessee, right. but she didn't. She said Tennessee. <laughs> she so, so you're picking apart her writing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, she actually spoke it, so. Well, and to, to go on with her quote, most of the Tennesseans who voted Republican are uneducated, so they don't even know that they showed up to the polls to vote against their own interest. They literally voted on color lines. Ah, I, I, that, I mean, she's, she's not pulling punches on that. I mean, I don't know if this is what she truly believes. Did you read the part... Where she said white men voted Republican over well over 60 or 70 percent. So obviously that's a particular base of people who believe in superiority. That and her vast experience in politics. And she looks to be 12. I I know this goes back to me being old and all that stuff. But all she her goal and, and I did a little research on her, Matt, is she wants to be a senator by 50 and she just insulted half of her state. Right. <laughs> I mean, is this the way... This is, to, how you, is this how you're going to accomplish that? Well, and, I mean, I think she's dis, she apologized, but she's forgetting how unforgiving boomers are. Well, she apologized, sort of. This, this is the... This is the the gray quote, my comments did not intend to make a generalization about every white person who voted Republican. The truth is, about a large number of those who responded with their vote for Republican candidates this election cycle is they voted in response to the racially charged rhetoric that has come from our president. However, this is the, the best part, however, we must not discount the election day data. We live in a state that is very racially polarized. When you look at the needs of the rural West, middle and east of the, of the democratic values speaks to their needs. I sincerely desire for the great state of Tennessee to give the democratic values a chance to work for all people. Which makes no sense at all. What does that have to do with racism? So here's a question. She said, we live in a state that is very racially polarized. Is there one that's not? Well, I mean, how do you define racially polarized? Well, I, that's, that's the thing. is It's like, how do, you, how do you define that? Because people, just in general, they tend to self-segregate. You know, even, even like the, the military will tell you, classic immigration patterns. That's why you have... Chinatown and Little Italy and things like that. Because they, people get into their own groups and then they freaking stay there. That's not racially polarized. It's just nature. I mean, I think what she's ignoring is that the opportunity to not be racially divided 
are debate racially polarized is there, but not everybody capitalizes on that. And she's assuming that the ones who aren't capitalizing on it can't capitalize on it. No, what she's capitalizing on is the true purpose of racism, which is to divide. Is is to is to divide us uh, based on the distance your ancestors were from the sun, and it 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 makes political hay for her to stand out and point her fingers and say the you know the jerk is one of the best movies ever made great movie Steve Martin and it was uh, Lord loves a working man and don't trust Whitey <laughs> and Matt you've seen it Jessica no I haven't before you t- I you've have never not seen, you, seen it you've never seen the jerk no here's the thing here's the thing you don't know about me Jonathan Giles knows and Jessica's been there for some of the conversation about it but it's very rare that there is a movie made before 1996 that I've seen. It's just a handful, and well, it's and it's the ones you would think, you know, Top Gun, Dirty Dancing, E.T., um, Young wait Guns. A wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa! You put those movies in, haven't seen The Jerk or Blazing Saddles. Nope. Good Lord, man. I mean, your parents should be prosecuted for child abuse. <laughs> this is going to possibly be the most heavily edited version <laughs> of this podcast. No, no. I think episode like three or four. Man, we probably, I think we, <laughs> we recorded for like three hours <laughs> to get 55 minutes <laughs> worth of stuff. Good, good Lord. Well, no, back, back on London here is... If your apology has a but, <laughs> right, if there's, yeah. <laughs> it's not a. It's it's sort of like, I'm sorry you were offended. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That's not an apology. <laughs> right. Or my favorite is, you made me cry. Well, I can't make you do anything. You're crying on your own. That's not an apology. <laughs> right. You're responsible for your own feelings. <laughs> I'm sorry you took what I said the wrong way. <laughs> I'm sorry you misunderstood my facts. <laughs> my wife, my wife loves it when I say things like that. I bet she does. But don't say those tonight. We don't want to ruin things for you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so we got the news that Georgia lost its bid for... Amazon, Woo! right? I, I, I have been sobbing, crying ever since this this news broke that we're not moving fifty thousand more people into city of, into the city of Atlanta on our roads. You know, and, and we talked about this. Um, like for me personally, that would have been it would have been very financially beneficial. Because you know, obviously, Amazon has uh, has facilities all over the state, and the company that I work for were a, like one of their vendors, certified vendors, or whatever that they I forget what it's called. Um, so we would have been we looked at some of their stuff, and it was you know tens of millions of dollars that we would have been. Uh, of product that we would have been providing for their headquarters had they come here. But I was glad to see they didn't. Well, Jessica, uh, it sure seemed like Amazon put on a, a very long season of The Bachelor. They really did. And, you know, the thing that's most frustrating to me is that all of it is sealed by like under open records laws and protections for the economic development company aspects of each state to offer these things and make agreements behind closed doors on the taxpayer's behalf. And then you don't find out until it's either accepted or rejected or announced or whatever. So all of this time, you know, Nathan Deal and his minions and Ralston and Cable were making promises to Amazon that none of us knew about and, you know, promising to come through and, like putting the legislature on the hook 
for certain acts and we didn't know about it and there's no accountability for it. And yes, we lost, but books, a lot of times we don't lose and they make all these promises that have financial impacts for years to come. And it's all at their discretion in the name of economic development. And I'm going to throw a number out there and it's, this is, this is verified, but this is a scary number. New York taxpayers to pay $48,000 per job Amazon's going to generate for them. Well, and you know what's crazy is that Steve Tarvin, who's a state representative in um, maybe Chickamauga, maybe, I'm not sure, Northwest Georgia area, but he commented on one of my articles that combined between what Georgia was going to offer, which was less than what New York offered, but if you can include what the county, Fulton County, DeKalb County, Atlanta, what they were all willing to offer, it was like $200,000 per taxpayer. And with no regard to what that would do to our infrastructure, our schools, the roads, everything else is to, is to and I, I know this is my theme, pick a winners and losers and hand our money to one of the richest corporations in the world. Right. And yes, they brought they want to bring jobs and they want to bring investments and tax dollars and all these other things, but it doesn't always work out in the best interest for years to come because you look at um, Mercedes-Benz, they actually offered their employees income tax breaks for coming here. So, the the yes, they're spending money here, but they're animals that are more equal than the rest of us. And I mean, it's just, and then there's people who say, well, it's not corporate welfare because you're just giving them tax credits. No, that's not true. You're, there's grants in there. There's actual financial tangible incentives. The infrastructure that the states and counties are willing to offer to actually build up in the name of Amazon and renaming of roads, all of those things cost money plus the resources to, to put them in place for 25,000 jobs. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Well, Matt, I found the whole process to be ridiculous. The It just really was... It, they went out there and they put their pretty skirt on and they just waited for the gentleman to bid on them. <laughs> right. Man, I don't know. It's government doing government. If I... I guess it's a good thing I wasn't like, you know, supreme ruler of the state or whatever. And been like, hey, what are you going to offer us? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> you want to uh, come here? Come on. If you, you don't, can... move on down the road. Uh, I can offer the Secretary of State's phone number to right. file for your business license. And uh, here's a realtor to talk to to find the, find, find the uh, real estate you need. Right? I'd, I'd have probably sent them to my wife <laughs> for that. You would, too, because you're dirty. Right? <laughs> no, man. It's, it. I was never on Team Amazon with this. I've driven around Atlanta. I can't imagine 100,000 more cars. Because you got to think, every employee has got a spouse, about, and kids, and everything else is going to do to our infrastructure to and if it's organic it's organic but that's not what this is is they were looking for the best bribe they could get well and you know I'm, i know i'm harping on the transparency side but why what they the argument of keeping all this secret is so that like someone doesn't hear about your offer and you get um like outbid or whatever But what's wrong with putting someone from all the states that are contenders in a room and make them bid like you do at an auction and put them on the record in front of the world to see and show exactly how much they're willing to sacrifice to bring a business to their state? Like the fact that this has to be private is 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 an excuse. Make it public. Put it out there. And if someone and that way, someone knows how much they're willing to pay when they go to this auction. And then you just have the Amazon decide right there on the spot. If they want it that bad, do it. No, look, if you want to move to Atlanta, you move here because we because of Hartsfield. You move here because you have 85, 75, and I-20. Not because the government gives you some sweetheart deal to move here. And I'm with, I'm with you, absolutely. And, and you, 
you bring up a very important part, and that that is the transparency. Is Cagle and Deal and the rest of the crooked bunch up there? They were not. They were not auctioning or, or bidding with their money. They're bidding with mine. And then they hide it from me of how much of my money, how much of my true sweat equity that goes into my money, they're going to give to somebody else who hasn't earned it. And that's that is that's a a, a point of view that I kind of got lost in the 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 money part of it, but the transparency, absolutely. And you know the these lawmakers who, oh God, the the concession speeches that they were giving to the press sounded like they were runners up on Miss America. Yep. And Sucks. oh yeah, and I mean and Amazon's buttocks is fully being kissed by every state who lost going, Well, we appreciate what little bit you give us and and it it, it really is sick. Yeah, it's disgusting. <laughs> and you know, I think it's hilarious if you've looked at a lot of the offers from some of the other states. And then you look at the fact that Georgia offered Kindle Road. I mean, really? Is that the best we can do? <laughs> like, let's just say I'm on your side for offering things, and I want you to negotiate. And you go to the table with Kindle Road? I don't even... You know what? That is the least offensive thing they offered. That is the absolute least offensive thing they offered. I, I don't care what they call the damn road. Stop giving billions of dollars to private organizations. I I totally agree, but my point is they thought that that was a bargaining tool. A road a named after a device that they manufacture. Like. <laughs> uh, if they renamed well, Peachtree <laughs> Kindle, that might be all right. It worked for Kia. Kia Boulevard is a is an exit off of uh, 85 South. Uh, apparently, Amazon's a little harder to get than a car manufacturer. It, it was funny if you drive down that way because you know I, I go down to Gulf Shores. Is you've got the Kia plant in the Georgia side, then you as soon as you cross uh, West Point Lake into the Alabama side, you've got all the companies that sell to Kia that are right, that are right there on the Alabama side. Then you go a little further, and you've got Kia's. I, I think they're owned by the same people now. Hyundai plant in Montgomery. I don't know if Kia and Hyundai are, are owned by the same. I know they're both Korean car manufacturers, but they may be technically competing. You know, and it, how about this? How about getting a, rid of the uh, income tax all the way around? Then you don't have to give sweetheart deals to anybody. Right. I know it's absurd, th- this idea that you should keep what you make. And maybe maybe go with a consumption tax. Uh, it's it's absurd. There's no way that that could catch on anywhere like Florida, Tennessee. Oh man, everyone sucks. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great time to remind everybody that these are our opinions and not necessarily necessarily those of all on Georgia. Here's an uncomfortable topic to talk about. Not that we haven't been there before. Ringgold City Council passes, I'm going to use this word they use, emergency anti-homeless ordinance. They found that among people living under a bridge are some sex offenders who can't find a home anywhere else, and that just won't do. All right, so I'll go first. Emergency. This isn't a freaking emergency. First of all, one of the guys has lived under the bridge for 20 years. <laughs> They're just now finding out about it. <laughs> second, second, an emergency ordinance is put in place when there's a natural disaster or a man-made disaster that has extenuating circumstances. This is neither. So I have a, har- a huge problem with the fact that they're circumventing the actual legal process in the name of safety and emergencies to put a... You know, to buy themselves some time to make this permanent. So, I'll just go ahead and get that out of the way. Well, Matt, Jessica makes a good point. Emergency, to me, means fire, flood, blood. At at what point in this last 20 years has, has this become an emergency that has to be done right now without due process? Matt's reading the story right now. No, I, no, I'm... 
Like the he better not be. It was his idea. I, yeah, I was the one that said it. No, I, mean, I don't know. The emergency part isn't what gets me. It's like whatever. That's government doing government. <clears throat> Well, I think there's a lot. Of I think I think with it. I think the idea that you're going to ban being homeless is just stupid. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? Buy them a house? <laughs> I mean, like, why would poor people choose to be so poor? I mean, why don't they have like more money? <laughs> right. Or what is it? The, I think the I think the fines for it are the most ridiculous. Thousand dollar fine, or jail for sixty days, or community service. If I was homeless, I would be like, you know what? I'll take jail. <laughs> well, your dating life would improve. I don't know. Is there a roof over your head? Well, yeah. Three hots and a cot. Climate control. Yeah. And it's jail. It's not, you know, federal prison. It's just... Right. It's just... It's temporary. It's a night out of the cold. Right? It's it's like city jail. Right? That's the, the easiest... My my experience with city jails is limited to one city, and like it wasn't that bad. But yeah, I mean, do the taxpayers of Ringgold want to pay to house all those folks living under the bridge and feed them three times a day in jail? Look, the according to the article, it, it, not every homeless person is a sex offender, and that's obviously the the excuse they used is uh, uh, a co- there are sex offenders and I think the mayor and Jessica correct me if I'm wrong said we don't know what they're doing between 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning so we've got to do something about this damn they don't I mean, know what I'm doing between 3 and 4 I was just about to say the same thing like they don't know what most people are doing at that time <laughs> uh, I, I have a insensitive question to ask what kind of parents don't know where the hell their kids are between three and four o'clock in the morning? That's they're over <laughs> under a bridge overpass with sex offenders. <laughs> Good God, man! <laughs> I mean, they're talking about these homeless people. Like they're vampires, <laughs> right? Yeah, they they come out after the sun goes down and they feed on the blood of virgins. And look, I'm not minimizing the the threat that. No, man. I look. I like. I have a huge problem with a lot of this sex offender nonsense. I get like those 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 sheriffs that were putting signs up in yards, you can't track trick or treat here, a sex offender lives here. I'm like, hell no. No. Like and I'm the first one to say, if you're diddling a little kid, man, just they should just shoot them and that's it. And be done. Because you're busted and you're broken. But the things that you can do to get yourself on the sex offender list in this state, I mean, come on. <laughs> well, and, and we talked about that before, Jessica, is the things you can be 18 and ha- have a relationship with your 16 year old girlfriend and that hits statutory or, or whatever whatever the numbers are or 15 ex- yeah exposed self and playground sounds horrible until you find out the guy was walking home from a bar at 2 o'clock in the morning and took a leak right right and these all get lumped together as, as sex offenders and now you can't if you live in Ringgold. There's only two apartment complexes that don't fall within the prohibited zone of not being within a thousand feet of a school or a thousand feet of. Uh, how, how's it worded? Where children gather. Right. There's a, there's that one city in Hall County. I can't remember the name of it now, but like per capita has more sex offenders than any other city in the nation because it doesn't have a school, a church, or a playground. Hmm. Well, what's interesting to me is the phrasing where children gather because that falls under bus stops right uh, man we, we got into this a couple weeks ago on this show it, it is so hard to come to the defense of sex offenders 
uh, without trying to hit a nuanced tone, which I'm not good at doing anyway, of saying this is not defending their actions, but where the hell else are they supposed to go if they can't sleep under an overpass? Well, this is, and the thing is, is if you read the language of this, it it targets homelessness as a whole. So not only are you putting the guy who, you know, is a convicted rapist in a, in a predicament for a living situation, you're also putting, you know, some homeless man who's never been in the system in the system. Because you're legal, you're making something illegal that isn't otherwise legal. It's not illegal to not have a home and to be poor. And the courts have actually ruled on this out west, saying that you can't kick homeless people off of public property when they have no other option. So, this this ruling on the law in Oregon showed that it, it violated the Eighth and Fourteenth Amendment. You can't send people home that have no homes. You, you can no longer, I mean, you can no more make homelessness illegal than you can poverty. Well, I think there's been cities that have actually tried to, like, relocate or resettle homeless people. But homelessness is a problem everywhere. It always will be. And, it, I mean, if they're just going to say they want this to be someone else's problem, they should just be open and honest about that and then let the community decide how they want to handle their elected officials like that. But an emergency ordinance and then a permanent ordinance on homelessness, which they're calling urban camping, I mean, it's disingenuous at the very least, and it solves no problems at the end of the day. <laughs> I, I'm not laughing at that. When I was uh, in high school, I did, did debate, and one of the uh, subjects was homelessness. And one of the cases that we had was to rename the homeless urban outdoorsman. And that would solve that would solve it because there's no longer homeless, there's urban outdoorsmen. Uh, you know, there have been several federal cases on this that shows you can't evict the homeless for being homeless. Now, this is possibly my favorite source ever for our service, uh, for our for our show here. The ACLU of Colorado will defend a Fort Collins man who was a victim of selective enforcement by the city's anti-homeless. This is, this is along the same lines. The city of Fort Collins has been evicting people who sleep in their cars while ignoring truck drivers. Uh, and saying that, of course, that's disparate treatment, selective enforcement. Uh, under the same idea of poor people, you know, poor people hurt my property value. Now, Matt, as somebody who runs the homeless people off your lawn, <laughs> right? No, you know, honestly, as, as a public lands guy, uh, that you know you you have lands that belong to everybody where does this fall in with with your views on amendment 1 you know i so <clears throat> it's weird because i've never ever run into homeless folks on public land. I've seen them squatting on private land in tents in, you know, come up on them in, in things like that. Mostly because, and I think it's because of the proximity to a city, right? Like, there's, you know, you go camp out in the middle of 40,000 acres somewhere, you're not going to run across a whole lot of people to beg for food or money from. Um, but there's interestingly enough there's a lot of rules that govern camping on public land and and, and whatnot like you can only they don't tell you that you 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 can only camp for so long but your campsite has to move every 12 days 
Well, you know, and that's that's interesting as far as as that goes. Is there's nothing to take out where you are. I mean, you can't unless you, unless you're bare grills living off the land. I mean, there's no that dude's gonna get somebody killed one day. By the way. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, he is. Somebody's gonna somebody's gonna try. Uh, I don't know, eating the apples out of bear poop or the other stupid stuff he's done. Nah, dude, the dumbest thing that I ever saw him do was advocate a an enema as a way to hydrate yourself if the water that you have available is tainted because you by letting your uh, lower intestine absorb the fluid you bypass um, I guess the the areas where bugs can make you sick and uh, what I was saying about loving uh, some of these sources uh, this story is about somebody in the Bay Area San Francisco who moves to the area with his girlfriend and their two dogs it is upset about the homeless they're setting up in the do- in the dog park, and the the verbiage of and I'm going to put air quotes around reporter is great about this guy's unaware of his own privilege of not wanting not wanting to see the homeless when he walks his dogs. <laughs> And unaware of the system that disadvantaged these poor homeless people and allowed him to move to his city with a girlfriend and two dogs. <laughs> unaware of his privilege. That's funny. <laughs> unaware of his privilege. <laughs> and I mean, I was reading, and look, the, the, the first part of that story is really, it, it's, it's factual about the, about the court rulings and, and things like that. It was the... the 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 part of having to uh, uh, his privilege, his unchecked privilege, that just cracked me up. Jack, I, I actually read the stories through. <laughs> well, in my defense, I didn't read that one. <laughs> <laughs> You know, in on the anti-homeless march, a health department poured bleach on soup meant for homeless, cites lack of permits and food safety concerns. Now, this is in KC Mo, where this loose group of individuals, volunteers would cook food at home and bring them to various parks. And, you know, Jessica, this is one of the things that, that, that I sent out to, uh, to the group. If it pleases the crown, might I feed the less fortunate? I just... Find me a homeless person who cares about the food quality and the health standards when they're hungry. Well, exactly. And Matt, is starvation better than having cold soup? Um, I wouldn't think so. But I, man, I don't know. Like, do you, I guess the, the bigger thing is like, government seems to care a whole lot about homeless people. Like, do you, like, do they bother you? I, I'm sure Jessica probably doesn't deal with, I deal with a lot of homeless people where I, in, in my day to day life, because of where my office is. So, like, they're constantly begging and whatever, and all the the traffic lights around my office. But like, I guess I just I don't give a crap. You know, it's just it's part of being in the city like that. I mean, yeah. I, th- I like I think it's terrible that they're homeless and and whatnot. I don't mean it. Like that, but I, I think they're probably that way through a series of choices they made. But 
I like I just don't care. You know, I don't I don't care enough to lobby the government to make, you know, ordinances about it or you know, oh, we should make sure that the soup kitchens that are feeding them are properly inspected and USDA certified, whatever it is, whatever, right, you know. Well, Jessica, Matt hates poor people. <laughs> no, I mean, is, is is there anything more repugnant than purposely destroying food meant for hungry people? Well, I understand these things are happening in the same town. But by and large, the sentiments are usually the same. So don't sit around and tell me that you don't want homeless people living under a bridge and you want them to be somewhere else, somewhere, I mean, in the articles, they even said they want them to be, you know, with a roof over their head. But then tell me that someone who's trying to do a good deed can't feed them. Like, it, that's not being consistent, and I don't buy it. So don't, don't play that game, you know? So all these stories combined are NIMBY. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, th- there's a story out of Fort Lauderdale uh, a couple years ago where they were shutting down a church soup kitchen. And it all came down to the local residents of this town not wanting the homeless to be attracted to their park. And it, all the all the complaints were about the what happens after you have a bunch of homeless people. And you read the comments and... The comments about the homeless folks are on par with the same way you describe a stray cat. If they get used to having food at this park, this is where they'll hang out. And I like to take my kids to this park, so they shouldn't be there. And, you know, as someone who is liberty-minded, is there anything better than a private organization helping other people without government interference? No, nope. there's not anything better. That's the way it should be. Like, that's how welfare should work. And, and you know what? If the the, the whole soup thing, I, I watched the interview with the health department guy saying, well, these foods are being prepared in individual kitchens with people who haven't had the training, and then they're being transported in the trunk of cars before being served at not the right temperature. I'm like, that's every barbecue I've ever been to, ever. Right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, go to any party, go to any potluck, any church potluck, and that's what you've got, is people who are bringing whatever dishes out, out of their homes that aren't professionally licensed to prepare food. And in the back of a vehicle that isn't, you know, licensed to transfer, uh, transport food and then serve to a bunch of people who are at a get together. And somehow we all survive. It's, it, it's a. Uh, it just got. I, I think you're right. It, it seems like an excuse to me. Yeah, but what's the end game? I mean, really, what do they get out of that? They don't want them in their community. No, 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 I understand that. But, like, if you're going to, I guess I guess their end game is to keep soup kitchens and things like that out of their community. Well, that's a power trip and control. Well, yeah, government being government. Yeah, that's not, I don't feel like there's an end game. That's just someone who enjoys having authority. And I, I believe that is a real thing. Is you didn't ask permission? How dare you? Right. And you look. And in, in defense of this uh, of Kansas City, the permits were going to be free. The training they were offering was free. It's it it, it and what what brings brings that to mind is exactly the 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 power part of it is they were going to not charge this organization, but. They want to give permission. They want. They want to uh, to uh, uh, control it. Well, now that we've beat that subject down, <laughs> right? <laughs> we we've figured out that Matt hates poor people. <laughs> Just doesn't give a crap about the homeless. Steps over him to get to his office with his privilege. <laughs> no, nah, man, I will. Tell you. There's this one dude 
he's 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 at the underpass at Fulton Industrial on I twenty every single day, begging for money for food, right? And in his defense, he looks hungry, right? But the dude is like for real ripped, like ripped and cut the same way you would be if you went to the gym every day, right? And his clothes are tattered and torn, but they look like he has done it, right? And he asked me for food or for money for food the other day, and he was wearing a brand spanking new pair of Nike shocks. And I was like, are you seriously asking me for money for food wearing a $120 pair of tennis shoes? And he just looked down at his feet and went to the next car. Maybe someone gave them to him. I'm guessing that... I don't know. Because he lacks some of the other things that I see out of the other homeless people there. Like... The other home, like, this dude has a new pair of tattered clothes every couple of days, right? And the other man, because, like, the office across the street from mine, there's this one dude that um, they pay him 20 bucks or whatever to cut the grass. And he, like, he wears the same thing all day, every day. Every time you see him, it's the exact same thing. 95 degrees outside and he has got this thick ass winter jacket on mowing the grass <laughs> well that's that, that's somebody who's truly worried about other homeless people stealing what little he has right now did he have a sign that says you know need money for protein protein shake bro <laughs> nope does he mention crossfit in the first five words he talks to you <laughs> right CrossFit vegan <laughs> named Brent and libertarian <laughs> right closing thoughts Jessica happy Thanksgiving oh that's right that is coming up isn't it yeah on Thursday man Thanksgiving for me is um only recently has it become an actual thing where I have to worry about doing stuff with the family because that was always just like, woohoo, <laughs> I'm leaving early on Wednesday to head out hunting. <laughs> I'll be going Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, God, God bless your wife. <laughs> well, now, th- that's what I'm saying, man. Since I got married, it's uh, I now have to do stuff with the family. <laughs> And, and and we have a zillion Thanksgiving dinners. So I like I pick one and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna do this one. And if y'all wanna see me, I'll see you at Christmas. It is so good that your family doesn't listen to this podcast. I think my mom I, does. I mean you because you sound burdened. Like, <laughs> ah ever since I had this damn family. No man, what, here's what it is is like every member of my family with the exception of five cousins right three of them are in and around the Greenville South Carolina area and the other two are in Las Cruces New Mexico every other member of my family lives within 15 minutes of where I'm sitting right now right I've seen you recently well, that's how inbreeding works, Matt. <laughs> Man, inbred. <laughs> you know, I it, I tell you what, it's good to be back. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, weird to hear somebody say that after being on vacation, but spending a vacation on crutches. I'm glad, I'm glad to be back. Uh, thankful to be back on the show. Have a great Thanksgiving. Eat too much, drink too much. Uh, have an Irish family uh, fight like mine will. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come get drunk with you, Dave. <laughs> yeah, bring a back strap over. We'll cook it. All right. I got one aging right now. All right, guys. Talk to you next week. Later. Kill him.